and welcome to the Love with Accountability Digging Up the Roots of Child Sexual Abuse panel. Foremost, thank you to the visionary organizers of the Survivor Summit. It is our collective honor to be able to share with all of you at this convening on behalf of survivors everywhere. My name is Aisha Shahida Simmons, and I am a Black feminist lesbian cultural worker who is a survivor of childhood sexual abuse and adult rape. My award-winning cultural work expresses its voice through the art of documentary filmmaking, writing, and activism, while being informed by my lived experiences as a survivor and Buddhist practitioner. I am committed to disrupting and ending sexual violence without relying on policing and prisons. I'm very excited to co-present with my two co-panelists, Mel Anthony Phillips and Dr. Gwendolyn Zahara Simmons. Mel is a folk street artist, writer, and natural born storyteller whose appetite for creativity and fierce love for humanity shapes and colors the unique perspectives he brings to the work. As a change agent, peacemaker, community activist, childhood survivor of sexual, childhood survivor, survivor, excuse me, of childhood sexual abuse, an artist in residence at Oregon Abuse Advocates and Survivors in Oasis. Mel understands that silence is violence in today's culture of rape, violence, and oppression. Dr. Gwendolyn Zahara Simmons, who is also my mother, is a veteran of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, a feminist Islamic scholar, Professor Emerita of African American Studies and Religion at the University of Florida, and a co-founder of the National Council of Elders. For over 45 years, she has traveled, lived, researched, taught, and lectured extensively throughout the United States and in numerous countries in the Middle East, Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Caribbean. My mother is also a, sex a survivor of sexual violence. Mel and my mom are two of the 43 contributors to the Lambda Literary Award winning anthology, Love with Accountability, Digging Up the Roots of Child Sexual Abuse, which I organized and edited. Love with Accountability comes out of my own lived experiences as a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. When I was 10 years old, I was molested for a period of two years by my paternal step-grandfather. I told my parents who were divorced and they did not remove me from the situation. And part of it, the reason being was that my grandparents provided the home um, that was needed while both my parents who were very engaged in human rights activism globally would travel around the world. And so the question I presume would be who would take care of Aisha um, if I was removed from the situation. I want to say that while my grandfather was my sexual terrorist, he was also a hero in the family who took care, was a low, loving and devoting husband to his wife, my grandmother, and he took care of her during the last 10 years of her life when she had Alzheimer's. And I share that to underscore the complexity that so many of us deal with when um, grappling with the abuse that we um, experience at the hands of loved ones and family members. Five years ago in 2015, I started sending communiques to both my parents, signing them love with, in all caps, accountability. Essentially, I was saying that my love would no longer shield them from accountability, that it was time to have a very long overdue conversation about the unaddressed child sexual abuse that I experienced. I'm also a filmmaker, um, as I shared in, in my introduction, and I made a film titled Know the Rape Documentary, which is available at knowtherapedocumentary.org. And I bring that up because both my parents are prominently featured in the film. My mother as, uh, talks about the abuse that she experienced um, in, in college, as well as in the civil rights movement. My father talks about his work as a human rights um, international human rights activists. And I share that again to underscore the complexities because while I was making no, I am very clear about the abuse that I experienced as a college sophomore, I was not tackling child sexual abuse. So again, 
these complexities around tackling one form of sexual violence, which was adult rape in the form of Know the Rape documentary, but not until many, many, many years later was I able to even begin to dig up the roots of child sexual abuse. And so I want to just read a, a clip from a clip. See, I'm speaking film language, an excerpt from the introduction. Um, I'm not in the interest of time going to go deep into my story beyond what I've shared with you because I really want uh, you, everyone to hear from two of the, co uh, the contributors to the anthology. But I think that it is important to set a context for this work. And I say, this is sacred space. When is the right time to talk about childhood sexual abuse? Even in our heightened contemporary awareness about sexual violence, we still do not talk about child sexual abuse, especially when it happens in families. How does one initiate in public spaces the often silenced dialogues about any form of sexual violence, most especially child sexual abuse? How does one begin the conversation in the midst of the justifiable righteous outrage about the rampant and virulent racialized violence perpetuated against diasporic Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Arab, and South Asian people, undocumented immigrants, Muslims, transgender, intersex, gender non-binary, physically and mentally disabled people, deaf and hard of hearing people, and other marginalized people? How do we have these dialogues about sexual violence in the midst of the violence committed against our youth through our failing, underfunded, and militarized public schools, the school to prison pipeline, the sexual abuse to prison pipeline, which is hoarding disproportionate numbers of Black and Latinx youth into the prison industrial complex? How do we have these conversations where there are currently two members of the United States Supreme Court who are known and alleged to have committed gendered sexual harm? I believe Anita Hill. I believe Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. Or when the President of the United States also a doer of sexual harm, harassment, and alleged sexual assault mocks rape survivors while his administration is doing almost everything it can to legally erase transgender people's existence. And by extension, I add intersex and gender non-binary people's existence. Everything that radical, disabled, deaf, and hard of hearing, able-bodied, cisgender, transgender, gender non-binary people of color and anti-racist white people have fought and died for for over decades is being dismantled before our very eyes. We are in the midst of an inferno of human rights violations in the United States with global ramifications. Yet if we continue to keep childhood sexual abuse on the back burner, this pandemic within our current pandemics of COVID and white supremacy will remain there barely addressed while millions more children suffer silently. Sexual violence is pervasive and touches upon almost every single social justice issue, including but not limited to race, gender, gender identity, disability, sexuality, education, housing, immigration, healthcare, mass incarceration, militarization, and politics. I believe that child sexual abuse is a core factor in most forms of sexual violence that people commit. Therefore, in this time of heightened awareness about sexual violence among adults, all of us must prioritize the occurrence, treatment, and research about child sexual abuse. And this is what led me to invite 40 to diasporic Black people who are survivors and advocates and one bystander, former bystander, my mom, to share about um, their, share their stories of survival and to co-envision how we can disrupt and end this pandemic that has horrific ramifications that impacts our lives throughout our lives. And um, there are, I would say, 42 roadmaps in this um, anthology that give glimpses, and it's very diverse in terms of age, uh, gender, gender identity, sexuality, um, geographic location, 
Black Latinx, Black Indigenous, Black Caribbean, African American, African. Um, so it's very important. Uh, and I, I, I believe that as a, a feminist lesbian, that it's, it's really important to be inclusive because it, it's not until the most marginalized of us are safe from harm that all of us are safe from harm. And so I will now pass the microphone to my mom, Dr. Simmons. Thank you so much, Aisha. Uh, thank you for inviting me to join you uh, on this Survivors Summit. And thank you to the organizers of this very important Survivors Agenda Summit. It is urgently needed. It is so important for survivors of sexual assault to be the ones proposing solutions to this worldwide pandemic of sexual violence against women, men, girl, and boys. While our society has only recently begun to seriously address rape and sexual assault against women with the advent of the Me Too movement, it has yet to address what Aisha Shahida Simmons posits in her groundbreaking anthology, Love with Accountability, as the root of sexual violence, and that's childhood sexual abuse. There are at least 40 million, a likely undercount, of survivors of childhood sexual abuse in the US. This abuse is happening right now as we speak. We have learned that the incidence of childhood sexual abuse has increased exponentially during this COVID pandemic when so many of us are spending more time isolated in our homes with our families. Yet these children often have nowhere or no one to turn to. Their abusers are their caregivers and those who stand by and do little to nothing to end these abuses. I myself was one of those bystanders over 40 years ago something that my daughter has had to live and suffer with over these many years. It is something that I have only begun to come to grips with in the last four to five years. Let me share a bit of my story, our story, as it appears in the anthology, Love with Accountability. And I titled it, a mother's lament. I am the mother of my only child, my daughter, Aisha Shahida Simmons, who was sexually molested by her step-grandfather from when she was 10 until she was 12 years old. When Aisha first told me that her grandfather was sexually molesting her, I did not believe her. I told her that she was having a bad dream and that her beloved Pop-Pop would never do anything like that. He presented as an upstanding family man, hard worker, proud provider for his wife, Aisha's grandmother, whom he loved dearly and tenderly cared for. For her, uh, I'm sorry, my daughter's grandmother had a lingering illness and did not work outside the home. She doted on Aisha, her pie, as she called her. For her, the sun rose and shined on Aisha. The feeling was mutual between the two of them, as my daughter loved her grandmother dearly. But I was also very fortunate in my view that my daughter had grandparents who cherished her 
And I felt that she was safe staying with them when I had to be out of town for long stretches of time due to my job. I needed my daughter's grandparents' home to be safe so that I could travel and work without worrying about her well-being, knowing that she was loved and protected, so I thought. For my daughter to tell me that her grandfather was sneaking into her bedroom late at night, was touching and feeling her vagina and forcing her to kiss him, these were monstrous acts beyond my imagination. It could not possibly be true, I thought. It was he who drove me, Aisha, and her father home from the hospital after her birth. He carried her in his arms as her father wheeled me to the car in a wheelchair. I did not believe it. I told her so. If it were true, many changes had to occur. Changes that would disrupt my life. I hoped that it was just a bad dream and that matters would go, and that this matter would go away. Oh, how I wanted and needed it to go away. It did not go away. My daughter insisted that, she, that this was happening. When I would question her about the facts, she would be perplexed about why I didn't believe her, and she would cry hysterically. I finally began to believe her, but I didn't know what to do. While I was becoming outraged at the possibility that my daughter was being sexually violated by her grandfather, I was disgracefully also concerned about what would happen to my job if she could not stay with her grandparents when I had to be on the road. Her father and I were separated at that time, and I had serious disagreements with him about child rearing. But I did, after a time, tell her dad that his stepfather was coming into her bedroom late at night and sexually molesting her. He did not believe it, saying that there was no way his stepdad would do anything like that. I shared with him that I too had not believed it initially, but that Aisha was so insistent that it was not a dream, that she was not making it up, that I now believed it was true. I said that we had to do something to stop it, but what? As I noted earlier, Aisha's father and I had been separated for several years. He was also dependent on his parents providing childcare for our daughter when either one of us was on the road. As a busy international human rights activist and labor organizer, he also traveled a lot. As I mentioned, her <clears throat> grandmother had a serious illness and was totally dependent on her husband for her comfortable lifestyle and the excellent health insurance via his job that provided the doctors who we all believed were keeping her alive. Aisha's dad kept saying it would kill his mother to tell her that her husband was sexually molesting her granddaughter and that we had to keep it a secret from her at all costs. What is so outrageous about Aisha's dad's behavior and my behavior was that in retrospect, we were equally, if not more, concerned about his mother's well-being, my job, his job, our movement work, 
and our reliance on them for childcare than we were about the tremendous harm being done to our daughter. I believe this sums up the outrageous behavior of many who are bystanders like myself to the sexual assault perpetrated against our children or children in our care. Thanks. Thank you, Mom. <clears throat> and just to remind you to sit back when you're speaking, but thank you very much. Um, I will now pass the microphone to my brother survivor, Mel. Thank you so much, Aisha. Thank you for, once again, the invite and for creating the sacred space that we could have uh, these conversations. Thank you to the conveners of this Survivors Summit, uh, particularly at this time um, of things going on in our nation. Um, it's a good time to be with each other. And, and thank you, Gwendolyn, thanks, Ma, Gwen, for sharing your story that folks, survivors like me, um, for modeling what that looks like for the rest of us. Um, my name is Mel Anthony Phillips. I am an activist, a social justice warrior, um, an artist, a writer, and uh, the artist in residence at Oasis in Oregon, which is Oasis with two A's, O-A-A-S-I-S, -A -A -S, the Oregon Abuse Advocates and Survivors in Service. And we are an organization that centers the lives and experiences of adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. So uh, yeah, and as the artist in residence in this space, I, I get to use art as a segue to uh, talk about childhood sexual abuse, to talk about um, dismantling rape culture, to talk about um, resolution to the scourge um, in our country and worldwide. And I'm very fortunate to be able to do that. Um, my part in the anthology um, is about compassion. And that place of compassion took me a long time to get to. So. Um, the Compassion Imperative, From Hurt to Healing, um, A New North, was my part in that anthology, and I'm so proud um, to be in that and included with so many wonderful uh, thought leaders and real champions of, of justice. Um, but in this moment, I will talk about the art and, and what I do and how I do and why I do and why I work for Oasis. Uh, so for me, as a survivor of childhood pornography from the ages of six to nine, um, groomed and guided by my stepfather. Um, after that, there were years where um, it was educator abuse, um, educator assault, um, sexual harassment, uh, teachers, coaches. And um, there was a time in my life where um, everything that I felt about me and the world was completely disjointed. Um, I didn't trust a lot of people, and I didn't even trust my own judgment. All of that as a result of being um, violated, being harmed, being deceived, um, than being silenced by folks that I loved and uh, trusted. Um, so for me, my artwork became, uh, started out organically. Um, I would get out my anger by making mud pies, mud things, mostly monsters or creatures that um, reflected how I felt on the inside. And as I grew older, that moved on. Um, to painting, um, sculptures, whatever I could do to feel like I was um, 
giving myself some type of relief from this thing inside me. Um, still, though, it took many, many years for me to be able just to talk about the things that I had never been able to talk about. There were no words for my experience. Nobody asked me anything about it. As a matter of fact, um, I had to be secret about it just or maybe my mom would be taken from my home. Maybe I'd be removed from my siblings. Maybe we'd all be separated and, and fostered out. So that fear of harming the family by telling what I knew uh, was always with me. But those things manifest in ways after a while that um, if you don't um, do something with that, um, things that you can't control, um, being unable to maintain loving relationships, uh, being unable to keep friendships, not knowing um, how to be intimate with your partner, not knowing what, their, what the lines are, if there were any lines when it came to raising your children. All of these things bundled into this ball of, of mess that I was able to work through for many years in many ways um, with art. Um, and because I've done that all my life, I've been able to turn that into um, art expression experiences for my friends, for survivors, for my communities um, who have had harm happen and have never been able to really um, express that. So, yeah, um, art for me is a healing space. It's a healing thing. It's accessible to most all of us at any time. Paper, um, crayons, sticks, whatever it takes, we can draw on that to write. A diary in itself um, can be an art piece that moves the world. I don't know Anne Frank. I never met her, but I do know that there's this 15-year-old who experienced some fear and some danger and was in a real place of unknowing, just like I felt when I was a kid. That diary uplifted to humanity and art. So I would challenge all of us who have that need to express what has happened, and we've never been able to do that fully, to um, think of art as that segue and that space where we might finally be able to look at ourselves in a completely different, beautiful, and recreated, transformative way. So that's what I do, and that's why I do it. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Mel. And I'm, I'm really excited to be able to engage with both of you about your your contributions. Um, I want to just read. Um, uh, uh, excerpt from from each of your pieces, but I'll read one and then engage with you a little, uh, Mom, and then uh, engage with you, Mel. So I want I'm gonna hold up the book so people can see what the book looks like. Um, beautiful design by uh, Catherine Bowser, um, who is a graphic designer and and AK Press independent publisher published this book. We did it in the, it was. Um, about 18 months from the time that I signed the contract to publication. So from May of 2018, and it was released in October of 2019 um, and available wherever books are sold. So please. Mom, I, I think what's really important, um, what I would like to just lift in, in is, is the fact that you are a sexual assault survivor as well, um, just to really emphasize like the layers of, so even what you're having experienced sexual assault, um, that you were still a bystander. And I just, and I, and I think that, that it's really important to just talk about the, the multiple layers. So I just want to read an excerpt of what you wrote and you, you said, wrote, I've been the victim of sexual assault on several occasions and risked life and limb to stop these attempted rapes. In the first incident, the attack came from my more, 
from my Morehouse brothers while I was a student at Spelman College in the 1960s. I had also fought off a high Nigerian official who was on a State Department tour of the country, which I helped to host as a Spelman sister. The most terrifying attempt at sexual assault and battery was by a Houston Oiler, one of the first African-American football players in, for a major team. Um, also during my years at Spelman, he tried to run me down with his car after I escaped from his clutches. The most painful of all sexual assault attempts I endured was um, from a fellow SNCC comrade who I had to fight off at the 1964 Mississippi Freedom Summer Project orientation in Ohio. This was at the hand of someone I admired and trusted as Aisha had admired and trusted her grandfather. But what was even more painful than the actual attempted rape by a SNCC comrade was that when I reported him to the official SNCC official, SNCC leadership, I, in this, um, I was told that they, the leadership, did not have time to deal with a trivial matter such as this. Adding insult to injury, I was told, quote, why are you making such a fuss? We don't have time for this. You should have given him some. I cried myself to sleep that night. A few nights after, I, as I now had to worry about being raped by a comrade, in addition to dodging bullets from Klansmen and other white supremacists who had vowed to kill all of us who were going to Mississippi that summer. In spite of having endured these sexual assaults, I, in reality, did nothing to save my daughter from being sexually molested in her grandparents' home by a family member whom I trusted with her safety. Why, I have no answer, and it troubles me deeply that I still cannot explain my inaction. It makes no other sense than me prioritizing my need to keep my job and our somewhat middle-class lifestyle. Somehow, I rationalized that this was the best I could do. So I wanted to just share that and, and, and thank you. It's, 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 um, it's what's fascinating is reading um, in so many ways, you're talking about dodging bullets and Klansmen. It's, and that was in the six, that was 62, 63, 64. And here we are in 2020 and a lot hasn't changed. Um, but just really wanting to, if you, in terms of reflection and particularly for people who are attending in terms of what can or should parents and caregivers do and, um, and just the, the layers of, se of sexual violence, the generational trauma, you know? We, I know that your mother and grandmother and, uh, you know, it's just, it's just been generational trauma. So, yes. Yes, thank you, Aisha. Um, I think to extend it a little further, uh, our conversation for our viewers, is to know that in addition to, you know, not believing you after having lived through uh, the number of sexual assaults that uh, you read from my piece on, uh, what really, even though, you know, Pop Pop stopped doing it and God knows I have no idea why, but what we did, meaning your dad and I, was to never call him to account uh, mm -hmm. and to cover up what he had done by acting normal around him. Uh, you know, we were in family gatherings with him, Christmas, Thanksgiving, you know, backyard barbecues, you name it. And we, treated him as he was the respected uh, elder. And so I didn't understand until somehow a light bulb went off finally, five years ago, that that was just unbelievable that we did that. But it raises the question of how do uh, we bystanders address the harm doers, though we're all harm doers, but the one who's actually guilty of the sexual molestation or rape. Uh, and this is 
the issue that I think we have to address. Uh, you have made it clear in your book, and I'm trying my best to embrace the idea that these people do not need to be jailed uh, and that we have to find other ways of addressing them. Um, in my own case with the sexual assault, um, after giving his name to the first uh, SNCC leadership that I went to about it, I never revealed who this person was. So again, uh, covering up, keeping secrets. Uh, this is something that I am trying to understand. How do we not uh, cover up and, and shield the harm doers without bringing in the criminal justice system? Well, and I, I think it's really important to, in terms of your instances of having been sexually assaulted you you know this was the the 60s i mean you know in in the 20s we're seeing what police are doing to our communities but in the 60s and in, in 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 jim crow south um you know the orientation was in ohio but you all went to i mean you're from the south you're you're a southerner you grew up in, in memphis and then went to spelman and then went to ohio for the orientation but then back to mississippi where you were for two years, um, you know, nobody was calling the police in Jim Crow apartheid, in the, you know, U.S. apartheid Jim Crow South. Um, and um, and so I think it's important so that people who may not know what SNCC was is the, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which um, uh, the civil rights was part of the, 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 the backdrop, the, the foundation of the U.S. civil rights movement. Um, so uh, I, I think it's really, I, what what I think your question creates an opportunity around you know not not to, not bringing in police one and 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 foremost if because what we know is that police policing in prisons don't don't stop rape if they did we wouldn't have rape we know and I will talk with Mel about his 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 um, contribution that um, people are raped and abused in prisons, that it's, it's not about rehabilitation, it's not even about accountability. Um, and so, you know, we we can't undo, you and I, what was done, like in terms of that I was molested from 79 to 81. Um, and then, you know, my grandfather became an ancestor and uh, he died in 2011, but in 2010, when he was gravely ill, um, I played a role in saving his life and I would do it again. Um, mm -hmm. I would do it again. And so just those complexities. And I never confronted him either. Um, so I, what I, when I think about how we can address it, I would have, I don't know what it would have looked like as a child for him to have been confronted. But even as an adult, I wish there could have been some form of intervention or just acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. I think for me, the work that you and I have done for several years, and then recently, um, my father, who is not a contributor to the anthology, the three of us have done a lot of uh, accountability work with each other, that that, for me, has been very healing. I didn't get that from Pop Pop, but I, I received that from you. I received that from Daddy. And I think what's powerful is you're putting, putting sharing your story putting out there about the your role as a bystander because I know from so many folks who are survivors that family members don't don't name the harm that they cause they find some way to excuse or juxta justify it or not talk about it at all and so often that's we just want it to we want it to stop when we're children and as adults we want it to be acknowledged and and thinking about the ways in which we can disrupt it um, yes. and so I Mel, I'm going to segue to yours because I'm keeping track with, with 38 minutes. So um, in, in your piece, the comparative, the compassion imperative is from a keynote address for the first day of Compassion Summit at Louisiana State Penitentiary, known as Angola, um, in December 2017. And um, I just think it's so powerful. I mean, you know, of course, I just, I don't want to see anybody in, in prison, but I just, I really think it was powerful that you shared what you shared as a survivor um, and talking to these overwhelmingly um, Black men. 
um, who were incarcerated. And you say, our son is 93 million miles away, but with the right perspective, I can hold it between my finger and thumb. Sometimes we feel as if we are 93 million miles away from any kind of salvation, honor or redemption, atonement, comfort or forgiveness. But with compassion, the space between hurting and healing closes exponentially. Instead of being light years from hope, the possibility is only one degree away. Step out, reach out, speak out. Compassion is a cure for the suffering human condition, and it is almost always within our grasp. I stand before you right now as a person in the midst of change with a change mind and redirected goals. Today, the glowing quasar of com compassion is that is what guides my personal path in life work. Today, I perceive my worldview through a clearer and much more focused humanitarian lens. Lack of compassion is a prison cell of its own, and I will not live there anymore. I will work to make room for dramatic change. There is space for a new reality, and in this expanded realm, there is room for us all. Let me close by saying, in the spirit of advocacy and compassion, in the fighting spirit of this day, and that boxing ring tonight, I will dig deep into my arsenal of justice to offer you this for the good fight in all of us. Let us be the gauze and tape and the solve to fortify and soothe. Together we are the bucket, the towel, and cool drink of water. We are the mouthpiece of our convictions and the gloves of defense and protection. We are the sharp needle, the unbreakable thread, and the stitch sewn in the nick of time. We are the sound of the bell. I will be a champion for you and with you. Together with compassion and grace, we will triumph over the forces of violence, injustice, and oppression wherever they may be. Right now, I am stepping out into the bright light of this new day to say to every glowing one of you, I see you. I speak out today in this harsh and humble place to say to all incarcerated persons here today, I see you, I feel you, I hear you, and I thank you, I got you. You are not invisible, you are not disposable. You are not unredeemable. You do have value. Your life has worth. You are not without power. You are not debris. Your life is significant. You can make a difference. You are enough and you are not alone. Alone. Peace. So Mel, mm. I ask you to please share. Yeah, Aisha, that was a wonderful, um, a seminal moment in my life that took me from a space of carelessness, uh, took me from a space of lovelessness to a real space of openness, and not just open-heartedness, but a real opening of my mind. I thought in that moment that that was a culmination of my life's work from some point to that point when really um, it was the beginning of a new awareness. Um, but all that said, um, with that piece on compassion, as survivors, um, particularly survivors of, of, of sexual violence, survivors of rape, um, and if you're a child and you're not able to really process that, um, there's, there's a lot that, that comes with, with that ball. And there's a lot that we have to do for ourselves um, if we are going to heal and be our biggest, best selves after the worst thing that's ever happened. And... Um, yeah, so as survivors, compassion for myself, um, I needed that. We can be so hard on ourselves. When I think back, for many years I was thinking, what could I have done? What should I have done? I should have done this. I should have done this. And then when I thought about the real thing and I brought 
my self, my real self at that time into that space, there was nothing I could have done. There were things I wished I could have done that I could never have done. I only had wishes and hopes and a lot of self-doubt. I felt stinky. I felt putrid. Um, there is a reason, even to this day, I will wear long sleeve shirts in the middle of the summer, right? I have this thing with my body. When my body was looked at, it became something that other people wanted. It wasn't mine anymore. I was befriended, not because people wanted to be my friend, but because they wanted to get under my skin. So I had to have a lot of compassion for myself trying to parse out who I was, what had happened, and the real deal. So all of that um, came to me after years and years of soul searching, looking into myself with art being the vehicle to look into myself and also as a doorway um, and opportunity to other conversations. But yes, it was that feeling that I could not get rid of, this feeling like a human nothing, um, where compassion really brought me back to my place of healing. And before I could look at myself as the beautiful spirit that I am, um, I couldn't be the advocate that I am. Um, so yeah, it was really compassion that brought me to this space of understanding and awareness. But once again, um, that wasn't a finish. I was very proud of that moment, but there's more work to be done. Um, and that's where your love with accountability comes into play. I know for me that compassion was, um, it was a space where I could see all the other possibilities of help and resource and actually see myself as help and resource and not um, some dysfunctional thing. But all that said, meeting with you, collaborating with you, being with you, understanding what you are doing and are trying to do, I know that love with accountability is the next step up. It's the next revolution. Um, it's, it will be the thing that brings down those walls that separate me and those really terrific men um, at Angola. Um, sister, yeah. I would have let so many of them go. I would have let so many of them out. I would have let so many of them go back home because they were not what they had done. And they were living at being new, being transformed. When I met them, we had all graduated from this, um, I would say it was, a, it was a course in compassion. So everyone in that room had made a commission, had made a commitment to love each other, to honor each other, to be with each other, to be in community in this hard and horrid place that most of them would never get out of. They gave themselves a reason to live. And that reason was to be in compassionate, loving community with each other. That's all they had. Yeah. And they were maxing it out. I, I can only imagine what they could do back in our communities with their sons, with our nephews, with us back in the streets being the person that they were always meant to be. So it changed my life in that my work is not done, but I didn't have the voice until I met you, what that was called. Thank so. you. No. <laughs> I think what's really, I mean, as we wrap up um, with like about five minutes left, just I think it's in terms of for survivors who are um, survivors, advocates, supporters who are listening, you know, to, to this discussion, I think what's, the takeaways for me are, you know, the power of art to transform, the healing power of art, the, the critical role that um, bystanders must play in disrupting and ending uh, child sexual abuse, forgiveness, but not forgi forgiveness on our own terms. I don't, I'm not, when I say forgiveness, really forgiving ourselves. So not that we've done anything wrong, but so often we blame ourselves because we're told that it was our fault, be it if we're children or even if we're in as adults. Um, 
and 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 recognizing that harm is on the spectrum that mm -hmm. most of us have experienced harm and most of us cause harm clearly there is a wide spectrum of harm raping and molesting is not the same as gossiping or talking bad about someone i want to be very clear about that but i i don't believe that we will be able to end this if we don't see mm -hmm. Um, all of the complexities involved, and I and and I don't believe in prisons. I want to be clear. But even if we, even if for those people who are like, well, I believe in prisons. If we know right now that approximately 42 million survivors of child sexual abuse are around, that's not even dealing with adult rape. And then if we say that each one of them had. A, a harm door, even one out of every two had the same harm door. And then we add up all the people who were involved who allowed it to go on or look the other way. We're talking about millions. So logistically, we can't lock up people. I don't want to lock up anybody, but logistically we can't. So we have to come up with holistic uh, survivor-centered, I want to be really clear, survivor-centered uh, ways for accountability. And that's what I believe um, uh, your piece offers for us. Uh, Mel, and I, I think mom, you, your piece offers, uh, an, it's an invitation for parents and caregivers, A, who are in the process of rearing children to think about what can I do to um, do my best to ensure that my children are safe, but also recognizing that you can do your absolute best and your child's not safe. I mean, my grandpa, papa brought me home from the hospital. You can do your absolute best and your child still can get caught, be experienced harm. And then what do we do when that happens? And then the invitation for parents of adult survivors or caregivers who weren't there to say, I'm sorry, to be accountable and, you know, to look at that. I think that that is the work that so many of us, that's what we want and need for healing. Um, I, I want to invite people to visit Oasis. Um, is it oasisoregon.org? It is oasisoregon.org. Dot org oasis with two a's o a a s i s organ dot org thank you yes and you can find out including there's been we're doing virtual book talks there's one already with mel um and and many other about 29 of the 42 contributors at if you go to love with accountability.com there's just wealth of resources including links to to oasis oregon um my mother's available on Twitter at G Zohara, uh, G Z O H A R A H. Um, and so, with three minutes left, if there, do you want to close it? Say anything briefly, closing out. Um, either well, one. I, I I just wanted to say to parents and caregivers, uh, believe your children, uh, and make the space that your children can tell you what's happening to them. Listen to your children uh, and then love them and embrace uh, them and find a way to remove them from the harm being done. And if you're the harm doer, please get some help so that you will stop harming children in your care. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to add, Aisha, that uh, for all folks listening out there, especially um, survivors who haven't reached out for help because you don't know what it looks like or what that feels like, reach out, find your community, find your people. I have not been engulfed in so much beauty and honesty and depth of character than with the people who are like me, who've experienced something like me. A lot of folks think that when we talk, it's sad days, but we have had beautiful transformative moments with the company that we keep. Find your people. There's safety, there's solace, there's resource, and there's love there. You don't have to do this alone. Thank you. That's 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 what's so important. And I want to say, as a, a survivor, 
for over like, like I don't know, 41 years. It is a process and a journey. You know, it, it is, it is not, there is no destination. It's ongoing. As I shared, I, I made a film about rape and couldn't even deal with my child sexual abuse. Um, it wasn't until many, many years later, five, in fact, it was five years ago, 2015. And I was molested from 79 to 81. So be patient with yourself. And there is no, there's no time limit. It's, it's healing. Healing is a journey and not a destination. And so we thank you all for your time and attention. And we wish healing and accountability for everyone who's been impacted directly or indirectly by the scourge of sexual violence. And thank you again to the Survivor Summit for this opportunity to share and hopefully to learn. Peace. Thank you.